Welcome to the second part of this tutorial. Let's jump straight into creating the render nodes. As I said in the beginning, I usually do the FX in one place and extract the necessary output from there and add it into render nodes. We can do that by creating the geometry node. All these RNDR underscore points. Going inside, create an object merge, reference the out points from the fiber effects, and let's hide the other objects so we have visible only what's inside this node. Of course, if we play through the timeline, we have the effect that we saw in part one, but only the points are referenced here. Let's add an output node and also a time shift. If you remember, in the first part, I was specifying something about a rig that controls time shift and the camera thrust through. For now, we just add the time shift and leave it like this. Okay, going back, I will just duplicate this geometry, call it RNDR surface. And here, instead of referencing the points, I'll reference the surface. Okay, we still need the time shift going back. And now let's create the rig. We just need to set up a null, go to edit parameter interface. We have here a bunch of parameters that we don't really need right now. So I'll just select all of those and hit invisible, then hit apply. And now the interface is blank. We will create a folder, name it time shift and change it to simple. Then we'll add a float. I will change the range from minus 100 to 100. Then we can scrub into the minus values and name it animation time shift. Let's add a toggle that we'll use for the camera thrust room optimization. Okay, great. For now, we won't use this one, only the time shift. Let's hit accept and copy this parameter going to RNDR points on the time shift. And then I'll just add a minus space relative reference. Then I'll copy this expression going back to the RNDR surface and paste the same expression here. Okay, going back, we will just rename this to thin rig. I will disable the visibility of the FX node and of the rig, move it to the side a bit. For the points, I need to go in the redshift object and on the particles tab, enable render object as particle. This ensures that the points will be rendered as particles and it's a lot more optimized than instancing spheres on all the points. Then on the surface, I will need to use tessellation and displacement and extract some custom attributes, but we leave that for now. Let's set up the redshift render node. Going into the out context, we, we type redshift render. And here in the redshift rop, we need to go in the objects and add rndr underscore asterisk. This means that only the nodes that have this rndr underscore and whatever name after will be rendered. I like to use this as a safety measure, so I make sure that I don't render unwanted nodes. In order to start a test render, we would like to add a camera and let's move it a bit backwards. We can also split the view into two and have one view set to perspective viewport and the other one set as camera one. Now it's a lot easier to see where we are placing the camera. We can also lock the camera so when we move in the viewport, we are also moving the camera. Let's leave it like this for now and fire up a render. Okay, um, I would like to disable the surface first and just keep the points so we can see the scaling of them. I think they look pretty nice. I also want to change the resolution in the out context on the redshift rope. Here on the resolution override, we want to use specific resolution. At 2K, we can see a lot of details. I also have a 4090 card, so that allows me to render pretty fast. It already starts to look similar with the example scene. Let's also view the surface one. The surface doesn't have any material, of course, and it doesn't have the alpha attribute. Next, let's start to create the materials. Going inside the material network, I'll create two redshift materials. One is the surface and the other one is for the points. We can already go back and assign those to the geometry nodes. I can just select the surface mat, copy and go back on the render tab, just paste and it automatically knows the path. For the points, we go to the render tab, paste again, and just change the name to point. Okay, back into the materials. We need to add a redshift standard material. This is actually where we build the shader itself. One is for the surface and the other one is for the points. Let's also add a focus point for our camera. So we will add a null. Something really nice about the new camera and redshift is that now we can specify a null point to focus on. We need to disable use Houdini camera focus top. We just need to drag the null here and we can also rename this to focus point. 
Next, let's unlock the camera and see where the null point is right now. Just select it and try to move it somewhere around here. In the camera, we'll enable bokeh and an aperture maybe one. Let's fire up the redshift render view. Nothing really changes too much. I think the aperture is too big. Let's go with 0.25. And as you can see now, it starts to get a lot blurrier. Nice. In order to build the shaders, we would need to add some lights. So let's do that. I'll drop down an RS light. By default, this light is an area light. If we go to the light tab, we can see that. I like to use a ramp. So it mimics more a studio softbox. To illustrate this, I'll drag the light towards the camera and disable the RNDR surface. Let's fire up the render. Of course, we would need to change the area light to visible in order to see the shape of the area light. Right click and enable allow editing of context. Then we can dive inside, go into the light shader, into the redshift vop net, and we can use an RS ramp. Plug this into the intensity, change the source to UV map just to make sure it takes the UV. And the mapping should be circular. The gradient is the other way around. Let's change the knobs here. Now it looks more like a studio softbox. When placing lights, I usually split the viewport. Let's make the light wider on the X and move it further to the right. I need to bump up the intensity quite a lot, maybe 11 or 12. Now we can really see the details in the surface. We'll further subdivide the mesh in a later stage. Okay, let's move it a bit more to the right. And I will just rename the light, then duplicate and add another one to the opposite direction. After doing some more tweaking, I think this would be the final position of the lights. The right one is way too bright, so let's dim it down to 9. I'll change the shading because the redshift light intensity is not extremely accurate in the viewport. And let's um, scroll to the timeline to find a better frame. Maybe 88 is good enough. Let's focus on building the shaders. I will start with the points first, and if we go to the material, we should disable the diffuse weight and the reflection because we'll only use emission for this one for the emission weight i use 1.75 and we can already see the points very nicely to drive the color of the points i used the same color of the surface i would like to already start using the alpha channel let's make sure that the attributes are being extracted instead of using enable automatic attributes extraction i would like to extract alpha and moths follow Going back into the material, let's use a color user data and import the alpha. I'll plug this into the opacity color and we will need to restart the render. The alpha is affecting the surface. If we go to the alpha channel in Redshift, we can see it being applied. To create a diffuse color of the surface, I went for a rather abstract approach because firstly I wanted to make it orange and then it turned out to be green. So let's see how I did that. Let's add a color constant. The color was 1, 0 0.5 and 0. We plug it into the base color. Looks pretty nice like this as well, but I liked more the green. Before moving forward, I also activated a lot in the Redshift camera. We need to go here in the settings and we enable the lot option. The color changes a bit. I use the custom lot, which unfortunately I cannot share because it's from less distortion. So maybe you want to check them out. And the file itself is called Kashmir 2. I also want to enable apply color management before lot. This means that Redshift will convert ACES to sRGB and after it will apply the lot. So if we do this, we see that the color changes quite a bit and it has a more filmic look. Now I would like to start using the new RS style node. It was introduced recently and it's extremely versatile. Let's drop an RS styles. I'll connect this temporarily to the base color so we see what it does and also enable debugging. The scene is black because the global scale is huge. I used 0.015 for this one. After resetting the render, we can see a pattern of squares around here. I changed the squares to circles 3 and also change the bevel width to 0.013. I checked randomized color and this does a really big difference before and after. Because I knew that I wanted to use a blend mode with the initial color, I needed black and white values. For this first color, I used white. 
that's the color between the circles the next one i used white again then the second color middle gray and the third color 0.7 in brightness this is how i used rs tiles to drive the diffuse and also the displace in order to get to the green color i used an rs color layer the orange color as a base layer and the tiles as the first layer and use the divide blending mode if i hit refresh you can see the scene starts to look really close to the reference the tiles change the base color from orange to green because of the blend mode to further tweak the color i added a color corrector node i've changed the gamma saturation scale and level scale because the colors are a bit strange due to the blend mode so for gamma i went with 0.9 saturation scale 0.9 and level scale 0.8 everything looks a bit more nicer right now in order to have a better response of the redshift live viewer we can change the size to fix scaling and this will split the 2k into half then i use the rs tiles to drive the roughness of the surface for that let's add an RS ramp, connect it to the tiles and then connect it to the reflection roughness. Here I would need to change the ramp values. For the shyness part I used 0.3 as a brightness level and for the matte parts I used 0.3. Or five. The tiles will break a bit the roughness of the surface. It's very subtle but it's there. I will use the RS tiles to add displacement to the surface. This way we would have really nice details. We will pause the render first and drop an RS displacement, connect the tiles with the displacement and then connect the displacement to the corresponding slot. If I would start the render, nothing would really happen because in Redshift we need to enable displacement for each object. On the surface geo we need to find the tessellation and displacement tab and here I would like to enable tessellation. I didn't use screen space adaptive at zero as a minimum edge length and two as a maximum subdivisions. This subdivides the surface and then we would enable displacement. Now if we start the render we will see that displacement is applied. Let's save a preview first. Okay something really funky happens that because the displacement scale probably is huge. So let's go inside the material and on the displacement change the scale to 0.0045. Let's compare the two versions. This is without displacement and this is with displacement. As you can see the resolution is quite low right now and that's because the surface doesn't have enough subdivisions. Let's see how we can increase the resolution on the mesh. I found out that rather than going to the tessellation tab and bump this up for example to 4, it works a lot better if we go inside the surface and add a subdivide salt. Then we would change this to 2 and we need to keep in mind that we have 2 subdivisions here and 2 here. So in total it's 4. If we split the calculation of the subdivisions between Redshift and Houdini, then the performance is a lot better. Another very important optimization technique before starting the render is to limit out of rustroom tessellation. That means that the redshift will not tessellate anything that's out of the camera frustrum. Of course we will do some optimization on this part ourselves but it's good to have this enabled. I would like to change the default from 6 to 0. I will save a preview and start the render. We have a far better resolution here. If we compare those two you can see a clear difference. As the displacement can kill render times, we need to do some further optimization on the scene. First of all, I would like to delete the surface entirely if the alpha is 1. To do that, I can go inside the RNDR surface or inside the fiber effects. But this time, let's go here and we can write a very simple point triangle. If at alpha equals to 0, then we remove the surface. Let's open the scene view again. As you can see, the surface is being deleted. We won't see it in render anyways, but at least Redshift won't apply tessellation and displacement over it. The second optimization that we can do is to create a camera thrust room and delete everything that's outside of its range. Houdini doesn't have a straightforward way to do that, but we can do it using a volume node. Let's make some space here. This volume node needs to have an initial value of 1. Then I would go to the From Camera tab use camera 1 and enable the view flag. Already we can see something happening in the scene. If we enable show all objects we can see where the camera is placed and that Houdini created some sort of volume that represents part of the frost room. Okay I need to change the Z near and Z far so I use Z far to 
30 and the Z-Near to 0.5. The resolution also decreased, so we would need to change the uniform sampling to by size and maybe use 0.5 here. Next, let's use a group, plug in the geometry here, then plug in the volume. The group has a really nice option where we can keep in bounding region but use the bounding object as a volume. And we have an error. We need to select points instead of primitives. Then we will add a blast node and the group will be group 1. We really nicely deleted everything that's outside of the camera thrust room. If we select the camera we see that we have a border here that we don't want. In order to adjust that we need to change the camera window. So let's just add probably minus 0.1. It's fixed on this side. 1.1 here and then minus 0.4 and 1.4 here. Okay very nice. Now let's combine everything together and I would like to add a switch. This switch will be used in our rig. To activate this let's go to our rig, right click, copy parameters, go back inside and paste relative reference. And I will still enhance the rig to also enable or disable displacement and subdivision so then we can keep a good performance in the scene. To do that I'll add another switch here move the subdivision to the right, plug in first the initial input and then the subdivision one, going back to the scene rig, edit the parameter interface, adding another toggle, so here we can say enable displacement, copy the parameter going inside the surface and paste it here, but also we can paste both in the tessellation and in the displacement. Now the rig works really nice, we can enable the thrust room optimization and so the software will automatically delete the surface that's not in the camera point of view, but also we can enable or disable the displacement both in redshift and in the Houdini viewport. I took a bit of time to organize the nodes and it looks way better. In order to finish the scene we have a few more steps to complete. One is to finish the shaders, the other one to create the final camera animation, add two or three more lights, prepare the final render and color correction. Let's uh, go back and finish the shaders. We can consider the surface one finished, but we still have the points. Enabling the points as well, going back to the material, starting the render view. It should start really fast because there's no tessellation and displacement. And I would like to use the same color for the points as for the surface. To do that I can just take the color correction from here and plug it into the emission color. But to make sure everything works I think I would need to have a UV projection. As you can see there's some variation happening as well on the point. So I really like that. I think it blends really nicely with the surface itself. Going back we still need to tweak the camera animation. Let's disable the thrust room optimization for now and I believe we need to time shift a bit the whole animation in order to have the camera start on frame 1. If I remember correctly I time shifted this by minus 20 frames. This means that the whole animation starts earlier and it should end around frame 110. Then let's say that we need a frame range of 130. Let's go to frame 90 inside the camera and try to find a nice spot where the mesh kind of intersects to one another. After doing some tweaking I ended up with this angle but I would like at this point the mesh to be more opened. Let's change this to minus 12 and take the focus point. Move it here. I will start the render once more. Okay, we are getting there. So this would be almost the final frame. And now let's animate the camera from the first frame to the last one. Going to frame 130, I will take the camera and move it a bit forward. Something like this. Go to the transform, add keyframe both on the translate and rotate. Then let's go to frame 1 and creating two views. I would like to move the camera backwards and more to the ground. Something like this, add the keyframe here as well and let's do a play blast. This is our first play blast with the surface, points and camera animation. I think it looks pretty neat. Final steps would be to animate the focus point as well. Around this area I would like to add a keyframe on Z axis of the focal point, then jump out of the camera view, go back to the first frame and push the focal point back around here, add another keyframe and I think I would need to move the timeline to frame 10, this way 
the focal point stays fixed until the camera reaches some point and then it starts to move with the camera okay let's test the depth of the focus yeah looks pretty nice we have a nice depth of field there and because we move the camera backwards quite a bit i would add two more lights for the first part of the animation let's duplicate the left and right light i will name them front left and front right select them both and drag them backwards let's disable all of them besides the front right one i need to move this way closer now it's very bright so let's change the exposure to 5 or maybe 5.5 and i'll try to place it near the focal point something like this then disable this light and enable the front left one the front left light i would like to be more as a rim light so let's move this backward move it way closer to the surface again dial down the exposure maybe to five nice enable all of them back let's go to frame 80 refresh the render and i think i also added a field light so for that just add a dome light i didn't add any texture on this one it was just very low intensity i think i used like 0.02 this way we have some feel inside of these shadows so if i disable the light make a screen grab enable it again you see there's kind of a small light bump here in the shadows. I like frame 88 as a general style frame. Of course, I think that the left light is a bit too intense and a bit too widespread. So if we go here on the left light to the spread, we can dial this down to 0.45 also dial down the exposure in order to judge this properly we need to enable the displacement as well let's stop the render for now go to the rig enable the frustrum optimization and enable displacement start the render again okay looking really nice i still have some almost blown out areas around here but we can still tweak that in the post process workflow Redshift has a really nice way of editing the render, so you don't necessarily need to go into a compositing software. If we select the new optical tab, we can change the exposure. Let's go a bit darker like this. And I can add some vignetting similar to Lightroom or Photoshop. The aperture, I think it's low enough, 0.25. Of course, this doesn't exist in reality, but because of the scene scale, we can go lower. The shutter type should be movie because we will render this with camera motion blur. By enabling the tone mapping, we can change how the highlights influences the image. So let's go a bit higher, maybe like this. Change the black threshold, lower a bit the saturation maybe something like this okay next let's work on the color controls as well enable it and try to play with the contrast curve i'll take the highlights make them brighter and add a bit of contrast now we need to go back to the tone mapping and adjust further the highlights and maybe add some more vignetting i propose that we change the left light position because it's bothering me a bit I will move it farther away from the camera. Yeah, something like this. Going back to the optical menu, change the highlights back again. Okay, now it's looking a lot better. Final step is to set up the render. Let's go to the out context, to the redshift drop. I always change the mode to advanced. Let's go to motion blur, enable motion blur. We don't need the formation and instances blur because we just want the camera motion to have blur. On the sampling, I think we can go with a threshold of 0.01 on automatic. A very important step is to enable Redshift to bake in the color correction that we did here into our EXR file. To do that, we need to go into the output in the post effects and enable mPlay preview and HDR file color management and post effects. And last, let's figure out the output folder. We have the render, then let's change this to OS slash OS export.exr. Remember, if we add the OS variable here, it's a very good idea to change the Redshift ROP name. So here I'll say points to surface v01. I would like to have a look over our render times. For that, we change the scaling to original size and hit this render button. The render time is 2 minutes and 14 seconds. Considering that I'm also recording the screen, I would say this is a good time at 2K resolution. In order to render the animation, we just need to change the range from current frame to frame range. And then hit render to disk. If you'd like to support my work, please visit my Gumroad page where you can access more source scenes, Houdini HDA and premium tutorials. I hope you found this tutorial helpful and that you're excited to incorporate these techniques into your own projects.
Also, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.